The Los Angeles Kings signed two players to contract extensions. We'll talk about those latest moves. Plus, it's time to start preparing for the draft. We're going to look at some players who could be available to the Kings at the 19th overall pick. All that and more on today's episode of Locked On Los Angeles Kings. You are Locked On Kings, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Kings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Kings fans, happy Thursday. You're listening to Locked On Los Angeles Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, talking all about your favorite hockey team and mine, the Los Angeles Kings. We are, of course, not quite deep in the offseason yet. I mean, other teams are still playing, but offseason moves are starting to happen. I mean, just today, just before I started recording this, Montreal decided to help Vegas for some reason. Don't help Vegas. Like, what have we learned? What has anyone learned about anything? Don't help the Vegas Golden Knights. And instead, here we are, uh, Vegas acquired Shea Weber's contract, essentially, uh, in exchange for Evgeny Dadanov, which is also funny. I kind of hope they'd find a way to trade him to Anaheim again, but, you know, whatever. Uh, Anaheim definitely uh, won that transaction because when Vegas posted about it, they were like, are you sure? Uh, which was pretty pretty charming. Uh, but, uh, you know, so off-season moves are happening. Teams are starting to, like, percolate on what they want to do. Uh, we're seeing some players, usually these guys on kind of like minor deals, low dollar value deals, uh, get signed to extensions. So we'll talk about the two that just came through for the Kings. Plus, uh, the draft is coming up. And unlike in past years, we haven't had to worry about like a top 10, top three draft pick. So, you know, we don't, uh, unless something crazy happens, we're not going to be in the running for like, um, what's his name? Shane Wright or whatever. Like that's not going to happen. It'd be funny if every other team somehow punted on him, but that, no, it's not going to happen. Uh, so the Kings are drafting 19th overall this year, uh, which kind of puts us in a weird spot. This is a weird draft. And uh, of course, we'll spend more time on the draft uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks as we get ready for that big event. Uh, but I figured today I'd phone a friend who has been doing his own draft research for his own team and uh, to get a perspective of someone who's uh, already started to dig it in to some of these guys who could be available in the middle of the uh, first round. So friend of the program, Jay Foster from Locked on Blue Jackets is on the show today uh, and uh, probably tomorrow as well to, to look at the draft and to clue me in on some interesting names, both from a hockey sense and from a cool name sense of guys who could be available in the draft. But let's start first with looking at the recent moves the Kings made in terms of re-signing players because uh, they've got a bunch of them. They've got a bunch of deals they're going to need to make. And the biggest one, obviously, is going to be Adrian Kempe when they re-sign him. He's currently a restricted free agent, so is in need of a new contract. There's a whole bunch of guys. We'll talk about them uh, in future shows over the course of the offseason. But the two moves that the Kings just made, one of them definitely going to help the rain. The other one, uncertain, really, how it's going to go. So first off, uh, this past week, they signed TJ Tynan to a two-year contract extension uh, worth an average of $787,000 and some change. Um, The first year is a two-way deal, so he gets paid one way if he's in the NHL. He gets paid less if he's in the AHL. There is like a minimum value that he's going to get no matter what. Um, Second year is a one-way deal, so regardless of what team he's on, he's going to get paid the same amount of money. Uh, which is is good for him. Uh, he is, of course, like the first back-to-back AHL all um, MVP since 1985-1986. He had 98 points in 62 games, 1.58 points per game, and was uh, absolutely kind of the lifeblood, the, the heartbeat sort of of the Ontario reign. Uh, his 1.58 points per game was the highest of any skater over a full AHL season over the last 15 years. 84 assists is tied for third most ever in the AHL uh, for a single season. So very well-deserved extension for TJ Tynan. Of course, the curious question is going to be, especially with that second year being just a one-way deal, 
Uh, Tynan obviously has to pass through waivers to get down, down to Ontario. There's no way around it. He, you know, well, the way around it is to sign him just to an AHL deal, but obviously that's not what happened. So it has sparked some questions of, well, are the Kings going to, is he going to fight for a roster spot on the Kings? Tynan has never really gotten an extended look in the NHL with any of the organizations that he's been in. He was part of Columbus's organization, uh, part of Vegas for a hot minute, part of Colorado, uh, now obviously part of the Kings, has never really gotten much time to show what he can do in the NHL. Now, lots of high profile, very important, big name AHL guys pass through waivers all the time. No problem. I mean, it just, it just happens. And so the Kings slash rain organization, if they're intending for him to continue to be with the rain and be a leader there, uh, are just having to hope that no one claims him. He feels like a danger to be claimed, but like, you have to wonder, you know, are there like gentlemen's agreements, like back channel, like, listen, we're putting this guy on waivers. We intend him to be like, a leader for our AHL team, like don't claim him, but like you see it happen sometimes. So it's going to be curious to see what happens with Tynan. Um, Obviously the intent is he's going to be there for the rain uh, to help be a leader on that team. He can play in the NHL. Um, Maybe he has a really great camp. Maybe he competes for a spot, but most likely they're just going to cross their fingers and hope for the best uh, in terms of sending him through on waivers. Uh, The other signing that the Kings made was re-signing Jacob Moverari to a two-year extension. Uh, He has a cap hit of $762,500, so contract will run through the 2023-24 season. Uh, He played 19 games for the Kings, two assists, uh, you know, acquitted himself fine for a young defenseman, 23 years old. He's always been a little bit of a late bloomer between juniors, having to go, you know, he played professionally in Sweden for a couple of years, uh, then finally over here to the rain. Uh, He... Spent some time, obviously, up with the Kings, most of his time with the Reign, uh, but also was kind of in that, like, black ace, healthy scratch role in the playoffs. So, you know, knowing that the Kings are going to have room on defense, uh, Ole Mana not returning, you can probably count on that. Um, Edler, I think, would be interesting to bring back, but don't know if he's going to want to come back. Uh, Troy Stetcher, obviously gone. Um, Movari could have a chance to compete for a spot on the team uh, with the Kings this coming season. Uh, He also, if they do need to send him or want to send him to Ontario for any reason, he would also have to pass back through waivers. So the Kings could also stand a chance of losing him on waivers if they choose to reassign him. Uh, Looking at the Kings, two guys still waiver exempt in terms of defense. Jordan Spence, obviously, who kind of surprised everyone with how well he looked uh, coming into the NHL. Um, He's most likely going to start the season again in Ontario, uh, but also Tobias Bjornfoot, uh, who I feel like has been around forever and yet still hasn't accumulated enough games slash uh, time and career to be able to, or to need waivers to go down. So Bjornfoot conceivably could go to the AHL uh, like they, you know, they like to start the season uh, if they feel like they want to keep a guy like Mo Ferrari up and not risk losing him on waivers. So uh, that that's an interesting choice slash conundrum that the Kings are going to be in. Uh, the rest of their guys, you know, Helga Granz, Kim Nusiainen, uh, Brant Clark, who knows what's going to happen to him. Clark either has to go back to juniors or play in the NHL. There's no AHL for him, but Granz and Nusiainen both waivers exempt. So they're just going to go whoop right to the AHL. But uh, Rob Blake getting some minor work done in terms of some of these smaller deal players, uh, you know, other guys still looking for new contracts, Jared Anderson Dolan. Uh, we've got him looking for a new deal. Gabe Bellardi's going to need one. Um, who else have we got? Mikey Anderson, Sean Dersey. Uh, you know, lots of guys. Leas Anderson, I feel like it's probably going to walk. Carl Grunstrom should get a new deal. Kempe obviously is going to be the big one. Uh, Brendan Lemieux, eh, whatever, Gabe Bellardi. Uh, so there's a bunch of guys who the Kings are going to have to, you know, make decisions on Kempe obviously is going to be the big one of a from a money factor and be, you know, important to see how, how they choose to lock him down uh, for, for the future or, you know, what they do with him. So of course we'll keep an eye on new contract signings and all extensions and all that 
here on Locked on Kings. Coming up next, we're talking with Jay all about the draft to get some introductions to some players who could uh, be possibly there for the Kings to draft when we pick 19th overall. Before we get to that, though, let's talk about Built Bar. If you've heard me talk about Built Bar before, you know that one of my favorite things about Built Bars other than the fact that they taste like delicious chocolate candy bar things, is that they come in tons of amazing different flavors. If you are like, if you're picky, if you like to change up what you're eating, if you don't want to just eat the same old thing all the time, uh, Built Bars are great because they have a ton of different varieties. They're always coming out with new and exciting ones. And the one that I'm super excited to try, and literally, as soon as I'm done recording here, I'm going to go to my kitchen and get one, is the Built Bar Mud Pie. It is... Everything I've heard about it is that it's delightful. Uh, it comes in both the built regular built bar and the built puff. Uh, the mud pie, if you're a chocolate person, well, this is for you. It's got rich whipped cream and chocolate mousse, smothered in 100% real chocolate, and topped with cookies and cream crumble. So pretty darn delightful. I'm seriously, as soon as I'm done here, going to go get one. Uh, if you are interested in health things, if you're interested in the, nutri the nutrition facts, well, built bars are always going to be high in protein, high fiber, low calories, low sugar, and really, again, just all around delicious. So go to built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. So this year, for the first time in a little while, the Kings don't have one of those coveted top couple of draft picks to, to look at. And like, that's a good thing. Because it means the Kings did okay this year. Like, they made it to the playoffs. Like, that's fun. Um, but that means that when we start talking about the draft, it's a little harder than just looking at, like, Quentin Byfield versus Tim Stutzla. Like, you have a lot more going on this year. The Kings pick 19th in this year's draft coming up, being hosted in Montreal finally after a couple of years of pandemic-related nonsense. Uh, and let's be real haven't really thought much about the draft. Like being in that like mushy middle means that there's just a whole lot of like possibilities. And so we'll dive more into the draft as we get closer to the date, look at more specific players. But today we're going to do a little bit of a like draft overview with someone who unfortunately <laughs> um, has had to pay a little bit more attention to the draft than I did. Uh, partly because your team, the Blue Jackets, has benefited from stealing Chicago's first round pick. So you have like a real nice first round pick. Uh, and so I've got, row, Jay from, <laughs> I've got Jay from Locked On Blue Jackets here. Uh, he's been doing a ton of work on his show to look at draft eligible players and do some profiles. And uh, I figured to just get draft time started, kicked off, I would bring Jay on to talk about what is out there <laughs> that the Kings could look at. So I feel like the first thing that I, you know, before we dig into specific players is we were talking about this a little bit beforehand of usually in the draft, you kind of have your first, you know, 10, 15, 20 players that you're like, ah, I know roughly where most, like, I know that this is the group of guys who are my first rounders. And this year, it feels like every draft list I look at, every ranking I look at, aside from Shane Wright, who is, you know, kind of indisputably the top pick. And I'm sure even then there's some people who are like, oh, no, pick this other kid instead. Um, every list is different. So in, in your like draft research you've already done, like wh what is happening? Why is it so weird this year? Yeah, the draft is just. And I OK, so first off, I thought this was just like potential, like, I guess, confirmation bias. Um, this is the first time that I've really looked into the draft in as much detail as I have. Obviously, I looked into it a little bit last year because the Blue Jackets had three first-round picks because we sucked. Uh, we sucked slightly less this year. We've only got two first-round picks, but we've got two top 12 picks, thanks to Chicago giving us essentially four first-round picks for Seth Jones, which is amazing, but we don't have to, <laughs> we don't have to get into that right now. Um, yeah, this draft is super weird, and I've been talking to a couple of prospect guys about it, um, most notably uh, Tony Ferrari, who is kind of the prospect guy. He does a lot of work over at the Hockey News, and uh, a guy called Will Scouch, uh, Scouching, who I believe was just on the All the King's Men podcast talking about the draft. Um, so you should check that episode out, because that's really cool. He knows a ton of stuff about prospects, and he does a bunch of like advanced stat prospects stuff as well, of like weird that I don't understand. Like, I know just enough about, about stats to make me dangerous. I, this is the way above my level, this math. But so I'm kind of talking to those guys about 
why is the draft so weird this year? And partially, I think it's because it's kind of a weak draft. Um, I think it's a stronger draft than last year, but next year, I think, is what everyone is focusing in on. Like, next year is a super, super strong draft. There's, like, I think eight prospects that could go top three. And any of those eight guys could be a legitimate superstar in this league, you know? So so next year is where everyone is really kind of paying attention to. But this this season, I think, A, it's kind of weird because we're really seeing the effect of that lost mm-hmm. OHL season, specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, the effect of, you know, Europe... Uh, European players have, you know, really only getting back to the ice this past season. Um, and so, you know, things are weird. A lot of guys were injured this year as well. There was like a weirdly high injury rate. Um, but talking to talking to Will Scouch about this, and he was talking about there's basically an entire standard deviation worth of change in the draft. Um, and so I guess the, the best way to kind of look at this would be to look at uh, Brad Lambert, for example, who... When I first started looking at the draft, it was very much a case of, well, he's the cons- he was the consensus number two pick up until, I think, basically up until, like, maybe World Juniors, and then he just started plummeting down the draft rankings, and now it's like, may- will he go in the first round? Probably, but I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't, um, and I, was talking- I think I was talking to you about this last night, actually, you know, there's a consensus top three, which, you know, is not going to concern the Kings, um, because they're not, they're not getting anywhere near. That, <laughs> Unless so like, something crazy happens. <laughs> something crazy happens. Uh, but there's there's Shane Wright, there's uh, Logan Cooley, and there's Uri Slavkovsky. Uh, those are like the consensus number, like one, two, and three in whatever order. Shane Wright should go first, but people love to overthink a first overall pick. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. going all the way back to like, man, should Jack Eichel go first overall? <laughs> should Patrick Lino go first overall? Like people love to overthink the first yeah. overall pick. Um, Beyond those three guys, the next, like, 20 to 30 guys, and that's maybe uh, 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 pushing it a little bit. I don't think it's legitimately 30, but, like, a guy that's currently ranked 33rd could go fourth, and mm-hmm. I don't think it would be that big of a surprise or that big of an upset. Like, the draft is just super weird, and I think that's why you, you look at, like... So, like, I've got a couple of draft rankings pulled up where we get into a little bit more detail about, like, who the Kings could draft and mm-hmm. who they draft, and, like... I pulled up three or four separate rankings and all of them are different, you know? Um, and let's just pull up again. Let's look at Brad Lambert because I've already mentioned him um, in terms of where he is in the draft ranking. So Elite Prospect has this really neat uh, little feature where it shows you where they're ranked in terms of, so they've got consolidated ranking, which is where they pull all of them together and then average it out. Uh, so he's ranked 11th on that. Uh, his he is ranked fifth by Smart Scouting, uh, which is a, a independent scouting company. Um, all the way up to um, TSN and Craig Button have him ranked thirty fifth. Go so anywhere. With thirty point gap between the highest ranking and the lowest ranking, like it's just it's bonkers. Um, and it's just so I don't know. I feel like I, my point has gotten massively lost in my in my rambling about <laughs> Brad Lambert, but. It's so hard to predict what's going to happen in this draft. Even for someone who is covering a team that's drafting sixth, I'm like, mm-hmm. right. I have, I again, I know who's going to go one, two, and three, not necessarily mm-hmm. in any order. I legitimately do not know who is going to go fourth and fifth in this draft. Yeah. Because it could be one of 10 guys. It could be yeah. one of 15 guys. So when you start getting into, you know, the Kings who are drafting 19th, 18th, 19th, mm-hmm. 19th. 19th yeah. Um, then you're like, well, it could, it literally could be one of like 40 guys. Yeah. Because... Yeah. And I, f- I feel like this is going to be a great year for like, there's always a handful of GMs who just go totally off the board <laughs> and just mm-hmm. pick someone who, or like they pick someone way too early. I know that like the, and it, and it's ended up working out pretty well for them. But like last year, I think it was last year when the Ducks picked uh, Mason McTavish, everyone was like, why have you picked this guy? so high i know the blue jackets have certainly had their their share of like guys that they pick early and you're like loves to (laughs) loves to go off the board but like um yeah like it this could be a case of and i mean the like for example just picking up uh scrolling down through the through the rankings like uh in this one that i'm looking at right now uh there's a player called maverick lamoureux 
great name, by the way. Played, yeah, uh, plays with you. He's ranked 28th on Bob McKenzie's board. Now, Bob McKenzie is probably the most accurate ranking. It, that doesn't necessarily mean, and again, we'll get into this in a lot of detail. Bob McKenzie obviously is the insider of insiders. Mm-hmm. Um, and so people look at his rankings a lot and are like, well, why has he got so and so ranked so high, so low, mm-hmm. whatever? Like, his ranking is not, like, more, more so than any other ranking, is not, this is the best player. Right. This is the second best player. This is who is the Montreal Canadiens going to draft? Yeah. Who are the New Jersey Devils going to draft? Who, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. You know, like, um, and so it's really interesting to look at his ranking specifically because he has like, I think he has like a 95% success rate over the last however many years he's been doing this um, in terms of draft. So like, it'd be interesting to go back and look at after this draft and look at how accurate he was. But like, so he has, um, just to go back to Maverick Lamero, he has him picked 28th. Ottawa could take him 7th, and mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. You know, it feels like there's always, and it, uh, this is not me dunking on Ottawa specifically, although it is pretty easy to do so because, you know, Tyler Boucher. But, yeah. you know, and I, I get I live in a, a glass house. My house is made entirely of glass. We drafted a guy that no one had ever heard of in the first round two years ago, you know, and then picked Ken Johnson fifth overall last year, which super excited about it, but definitely a little yeah. bit of a reach, you know? Yeah. Um, so like that's kind of that's kind of where we're at is it's so difficult to predict, generally speaking, because GMs, every mm-hmm. team has a different board. You know, yeah. it's not the case of this guy's the best player in the draft. This guy's the second, this guy is the third. Yeah. It's what does the team need? You yeah. know, that's why there's a lot of conversation about who New Jersey is going to draft because Logan Cooley, by all accounts, I think basically everyone has agreed, Logan Cooley is a better player than Uri Slavkovsky. Mm-hmm. However, the Devils have uh, Jack Hughes as their number one center, Nico Hisha as their number two mm-hmm. center. You know, like they don't need another top six center. Mm-hmm. That'd be dumb to draft a guy like Logan Cooley, force him to the wing, and you lose right. a lot of what makes Logan Cooley Logan Cooley when you do so. So, is he a better player? Sure, but is he going to fit into what the Devils need? Probably not. So, yeah, yeah, it feels like there's more opportunity for teams to like, because I feel like you know, especially if you have one of those high picks, it's got to be weird to be like, this is the best guy available, but we don't need him. <laughs> um, and I feel like this 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 draft being so goofy puts them maybe in an easier position of not having to feel that like pressure you know, internally, externally, whatever, to be like, why didn't you pick the absolute very best player left, you know, on the board when you're like, well, but we don't need, a, yeah, we don't need a 14th center. We need, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, and so and it, it like, might and then when you those, get back yeah. down to, when you get to the Kings, like, for example, mm-hmm. 19th, such a wide, like the margin is so small there. Yeah. That, again, you could pick a guy that like, uh, Oh, I don't know. I can. I don't know if I can talk about this. We did a mock draft for the uh, locked on, and uh, look at like looking through all of these uh, rankings that I've got pulled up. Mm-hmm. There is a player that is in the top, uh, the top eight of every mm-hmm. single one of these rankings that did not get drafted in the mock draft, <laughs> and we did a, we did a top sixteen. You know. So yeah. without wanting to spoil who that is, uh, that dra- those draft rankings will be coming out at some point, um, or those mock draft their videos, excuse me. But yeah, like the Kings could have, for example, uh, like I wouldn't be surprised if Brad Lambert is available mm-hmm. at nine, at which point you should absolutely take yeah. Brad Lambert, you know? Uh, Frank Nazar could be available at 19th. Uh, Joaquin Kamel could be available at 19th. Like... A guy, a guy like Jonathan Lekarimaki, uh, who is ranked, you know, again, pretty consistently in the top 10. Like, these are all guys that could be available yeah. at 19th. But there are also guys that could go in the top 10 and no one would ban I. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, the the one thing that, you know, the Kings, especially in the, the Rob Blake era of running the team, like, they, they have done very well drafting. You know, I, I know that people were already – kind of relitigating, you know, Alex Turcotte, Gabe Velarde, but like, you know, based on the information you had at the time with them, we didn't know Gabe Velarde's back was going to like implode. We didn't know Alex Turcotte wasn't going to get like four concussions and COVID was going to happen and whatever. Like some of these guys, their trajectories just haven't worked out, but it's not necessarily because of the player, 
you know, not being as skilled as you thought they were. But for the most part, the Kings have drafted pretty well. They they get surprises. Like, you know, Brock Faber was a guy who, when the Kings drafted him, everyone was like losing their minds because they moved up to get him, but they still got him, you know, it wasn't like a first round pick, you know, he, he sat there for a little bit. Um, and, you know, or guys like Arthur Kaliev, who everyone kind of passes on because of, you know, this concern or that concern. And here he is NHL regular, probably going to get more chances this coming season to, you know, play in the top six and has a shot that like every team wants a shot like that on, on their roster. They just have to put the whole package together. Uh, so it, it'll be really interesting to see who they pick and you know, especially once you get into later rounds, what they're going to do because they always surprise someone. There's always someone that they pick that everyone is like, oh, the Kings just stole this guy. Um, or, you know, even look at like, um, I think what, like Matt Roy, I think was like a seventh round pick or something. And, you know, here he is. Uh, so, you know, when I, when I look at the Kings prospect pool and when I look at, you know, where, where they still need help, um, you know, they drafted uh, Brant Clark last season. Uh, you know, he is, has potential number one defenseman, you know, potential, I guess, you know, and obviously hasn't made his NHL debut yet, but is a guy who you could see maybe if he has a great camp making the roster and the Kings have like, so like too many defensemen, which is not a bad problem, but you know, you have Brock Faber who is, you know, in college has decided to return for one more year to try to, you know, chase down that frozen four championship thing. Uh, you've got Helga Granz who is developing nicely in the AHL. He's going to take a little longer, but you know, he's still pretty young, but everyone looks pretty highly at him. So it's like, you know, and of course they have a bunch of other guys in the pipeline too. And you're like, all right, well, we, we've got, we've got those. Um, at number 19, you're not going to get an elite defense. You know, you're not going to get Drew Doughty 2.1 or something uh, to have another, like, you know, you have Brant Clark as maybe your next successor there. Like, all right, who's your number two defenseman. You're not going to get that necessarily at 19, but the problem the Kings have always had historically hasn't mattered who the coach is hasn't mattered who's in charge who's in the front office they just don't have players who score goals all the time uh you know you get your late developers like adrian kempe who finally figured out how to like put everything together but i think the kings are going to continue to prioritize guys who can score and looking at what they've got in terms of you know, down the middle, they've got Andre Kopitar, they've got Phil Deneau on a long deal. You have Quentin Byfield, who you hope can come up and eventually work his way into that mix. Uh, you've got guys still down in the AHL, like, you know, Gabe Velarde, you've got Alex Turcotte, you've got, um, what's his name, Akil Thomas. Like, there's a lot of guys coming up who can play that center role. And, you know, similar to like what you were talking about, like, do you want to draft a guy who you could, you like, you're like, mm, we're going to draft you, but we're not going to actually play you where, your strongest, you know, or you just go for a guy who you're like, yeah, this guy is a left wing and we know he's good at that. And that's who we're going to pick. Um, you know, so when I'm looking at what the Kings could be looking for, I definitely tend to look more towards, you know, the scoring winger kind of profile of, you know, you're going to put pucks in nets. You're good at reading plays from your teammates and going to the net and whatever. Um, and, you know, the Kings also have had a really good, like habit of drafting players, you know, it feels very Dean Lombardi, but drafting guys for their leadership, for their heart, whatever. Uh, and they have a very specific kind of profile of, of player they're looking at. Like Todd McClellan always says, like, you know, if we don't have the puck, we want to be the hardest players to get it back from. We, we're going to go back. At, like he wants those like guys who are just going to be annoying <laughs> until they get the puck back from you. And so I feel like that's probably who they're they're looking for is – scores goals gives 110% because this is hockey and we love cliches um, and hoping that maybe someone tumbles down to them because of such a weird draft that <laughs> that we're looking at. That is it for today. Thank you so much to Jay for jumping on and talking about the draft with me. There of course is more draft talk. We're going to go through some other players the Kings should keep their eyes on. So stay tuned for more episodes talking about the draft with Jay coming up. Uh, this week, maybe next week on Locked on Kings. Until next time, you can find me on Twitter at Right Said Sarah. The show's on Twitter at Locked on LA Kings. Go give it a follow. Say hello. Uh, we are running out of time for the uh, Kings Awards, the, the Locked on LA Kings 
awards, second annual awards palooza. You can go to bit.ly slash kings2022 awards, all lowercase 2022 obviously is the numbers, or go to Twitter. I've been linking it on there. Uh, go fill it out, bit.ly slash kings2022 awards to uh, make, make your thoughts and feelings known on stuff like MVP, best newcomer, best hair, best Dustin Brown memory. Share all of that at the uh, awards form, bit.ly slash kings2022 awards. That is it for today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing, telling your friends all about the show, and uh, just hanging out with me here as we talk about the Kings. Until next time, this has been Locked on Los Angeles Kings, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.